I'm Inez Stepman. I'm Ben Weingarten. I'm Amber Duke. And I'm Will Chamberlain. And this is NatCon Squad, where common good and common sense meet. NatCon Squad is produced by the Edmund Burke Foundation, the home for national conservatism. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Okay, so we have a lineup of both very important foreign and domestic issues for you this week. Um, first, we're going to have Amber talk to us about uh, the deal, the potential deal in the Senate about immigration uh, and the attempt to make the Republican Party also complicit in the Biden open border. Um, then we're going to go to Ben. We're going to talk about our lack of response to dead American uh, service members, um, in, in by Iranian proxies, right? So we're going to talk about that. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about Brian Johnson and the uh, big tech mentality of year zero. Uh, there was a clip that went viral uh, recently where he he calls for a year zero. And then finally, we're going to wrap it up with uh, the revelations about Unwara. Is that how? <laughs> I've never known how to pronounce that, but um, the UN agency that is allegedly there to provide humanitarian aid in Gaza and to Palestinians and their very large terrorist problem. Um, and this is an organization that gets donations from many, many countries in the, the tune of millions of dollars. So that's our lineup for today. And with that, I'm going to kick it over to Amber. Thanks, Inez. And uh, it's hard to overstate how bad this deal that's being floated around is in the Senate. The lead negotiator on it is James Lankford, a uh, Republican, and he is working with Democrats like Chuck Schumer to um, supposedly fix the crisis at the border, but it turns out, according to reported details of the deal, that it would actually do quite the opposite. So far, according to some reporting, we know that this deal would automatically give work permits to illegal immigrants who are released from custody, which is the vast majority of them right now under the Biden administration because they are um, doing catch and release as a matter of course. The deal would increase uh, the amount of green cards issued each year to 50, uh, up 50,000 from its current number. It would also give green cards to adult children of H-1B visa holders. It would not change Biden's parole system through which he is using to give temporary legal status to a number of illegal immigrants from Central America. And Perhaps the worst measure is that it would only uh, prevent the Biden administration from engaging in catch and release policies if the daily number of illegal immigrants crossing the border is at 8,500 or above, or if it averages 5,000 or above across a period of seven days. And just like breaking down these policy measures, I don't it's unclear to me why anything related to the legal immigration system would be in a supposed border security package. But then you look at things like work permits of still doing catch and release until you hit this magic number. These are both increasing the pool factors for why illegal immigrants try to cross the border in the first place. I mean, especially the work permits. If you release someone from custody and then immediately give them the opportunity to work in the United States, you're just incentivizing the behavior even further. Pretty much the only thing in this deal so far that we've heard that would reduce pool factors is that it would tighten the initial interview for an asylum seeker to make that bar a little bit higher. But everything else that we've heard is actually just uh, incentivizing the problem. And then you compare this to the bill that's been advanced by House Republicans, which is HR2, and that includes actual border security measures like mandatory E-Verify to make sure that companies are not just hiring on all of these illegal immigrants. It would actually tighten the asylum process, including preventing people from claiming asylum unless they come through a port of entry. So you can't get away with swimming across the Rio Grande stepping one foot on American soil and then saying, no, 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 I'm here for asylum. It would end the Flores Agreement, which essentially sets limits on how long you can detain um, illegal immigrants, particularly families. Um, this was what led to the so-called family separation policy under the Trump administration, which as viewers of this podcast probably know, was not a family separation policy. It was a policy to prosecute every illegal crosser. And in the service of holding all of them, the Flores Agreement requires that you have to separate kids and adults if you're going to hold them for more than 72 hours and would uh, increase uh, or continue construction of the border wall. 
So HR2, obviously a meaningful border security package compared to the Lankford agreement with the Democrats, which is basically um, the opposite. Now, James Lankford has tried to defend this deal by saying that the reported elements of it are merely internet rumors and has also accused his colleagues who don't support the deal of opposing it because they're in an election year and they don't want to give Biden a victory on the border, which is just nonsense. I mean, first of all, this deal itself is a win to Biden because it allows him to continue these open border policies uh, for, for as long and, and, and as frequently as he wants to. Um, and we, we well know that Biden has the, the ability to secure the border through executive action. He doesn't need Congress to pass a bill to secure the border. All he has to do is re-implement the executive orders that were signed during the Trump administration across 2019 and 2020, which led to a 50% plus reduction in the number of illegal encounters at the border across just a year. But he won't do that. He wants to force Congress's hand because he knows that they either won't come to an agreement and he can continue doing what he's doing, or they will advance something like the Lankford Schumer deal. Um, the Oklahoma GOP, which is where James Lankford is from, has actually censored him for his behavior. Um, they said that they will no longer support him until he backs away from this deal or brings forward a better one. And Speaker Mike Johnson of the House has indicated that he's not interested in having his members vote on this, which I think are both welcome developments, considering just how poisonous this package is. But even the fact that this was negotiated in the, in the first place, apparently behind closed doors, it had the support of Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, who described it as a good deal, is beyond disturbing. It would be the GOP just shooting itself in the foot on an obviously winning issue. The vast majority of Americans want more border security. And uh, again, uh, other things in this bill that I just need to mention is that uh, it would increase the number of border patrol agents, asylum officers, and detention beds, which again, does nothing to decrease the number of people coming here. It just allows you to process them faster. And if the Biden administration's charge for immigration is to do catch and release, you're just increasing the ability of them to do that. You're allowing them to import more illegal immigrants into the interior of the United States uh, more quickly. It's a testament, I think, to just the, the massive stupidity of the GOP, the fact that they um, continuously are, are able to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. Again, this is a winning issue for them. It shouldn't be that difficult to hold the line. And yet here we have some of the, the party leaders, the top, the top members of the party, um, openly and willingly negotiating in bad faith with the Democrats in a way that would actually uh, make the problem much worse. Yeah, by, by my back, the envelope calculations, right, uh, that 5,000 a day threshold is nearly 2 million illegal immigrants every single year into the United States. So under a four-year Biden term, you're talking about 8 million people, something the size, just under the size of New York City uh, illegally in the United States before we even bother to try to enforce the border. I mean, that that is the definition of insane. Um just a couple points to make here. Uh, one, I, I want to point to again, the fact that we're even having this battle and dragging this kicking and screaming GOP uh, into this border enforcement battle, I think shows how successful the political tactic was of redirecting migrants towards blue cities and blue centers. And again, I've said this before, I mean, this sucks for me. I don't like having to be enriched by the diversity in Tompkins Square Park. Uh that the like big migrant center that's there, there are like packs of, of uh, again, young men um, roving around and they just beat up and <laughs> they beat up cops in Times Square. This is personally very bad for me, but I think it shows how successful it was as a political tactic because the media was able to hide a lot of the costs of decades of open border policies and, and mass illegal immigration into the United States. Um, as long as it was down there with those, those people on the border, nobody cares in like New York or um, or Aspen or, uh, um, you know, what was the other place? Oh, Martha's Vineyard, right? Um, they, they could imagine that, oh, it's just a bunch of, of racists down there on the border. They don't like Mexicans or whatever it is. Um, and so I think this has been very successful. It has has 
in some way broadened the 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 feeling of crisis for people uh when in in reality of course like in a fully functioning political system we would expect you know citizen solidarity and we wouldn't expect people in new york city to dismiss their fellow citizens in laredo but that's like just the reality of the situation now so i think it's been enormously successful and, and forced the republican party to actually really take this seriously and go on the attack on this even though as amber just pointed out i, I realize that's that's still a difficult seems to be a difficult concept for a large part of the party um and finally i i'm still want to say uh, maybe i'll talk about this in, in final thoughts so as not to take up too much time but i still think that the narrowing or overturning of arizona against the u.s is on the table that will if that happens, that will allow states to actually participate in enforcing uh, an, a real border in a way that the federal government has decided not to do, not just under this administration, just most egregiously under this administration, but really going back decades under Republicans and Democrats. Um, I think that it's ridiculous what the Senate GOP is doing. Ted Cruz did a press conference a while back, along with some other Republican senators, where he characterized this as Senate GOP leadership at war with House GOP leadership, because really what they're trying to do is they're trying to get money for Ukraine. That's the underlying impetus of what the Senate GOP is doing. Uh, they know the House won't give any money for Ukraine unless there is some meaningful increase in security on the border or apparent increase, I guess the Senate GOP leadership thinks. And so it's a cynical exercise to try and put the House GOP in a bind to sign on to legislation about border security when we all know it's really not. Um, we know that Mitch McConnell doesn't care about a meaningfully secure border. We certainly know that James Lankford doesn't care. Uh, and yet they they continue to carry on with the stunt and try and squeeze the House GOP, which is you know bizarre because it, supposedly these people are all in the same party. In reality, it's the Senate GOP is in a party of the past the old GOP that doesn't care about immigration, that wants to admit as many illegal immigrants as possible, that is utterly and completely corporatist. And these people, I mean, you know, they hate Donald Trump and they, boy, do they deserve another Donald Trump presidency. Uh, they really do. They, they've, they've impressed upon us that um, they really deserve to be frustrated and annoyed with the, the sitting president. So uh, very embarrassing for Senate Republicans. Um, what more can be said about a piece of legislation that seemingly is going to legitimize the invasion and make it a GOP and Democrat sponsored invasion? Uh, it's worth noting also, I mean, just stepping back 30,000 feet, the entire sort of populist fervor that has taken hold and nationalist fervor that's taken hold across the Western world for now almost a decade and running has been rooted in the issue of immigration, the seminal kind of unifying issue across a variety of countries with different peoples. Immigration, obviously, because it's one of the most fundamental aspects of being a nation, who the people are that constituted it, and whether you have sovereignty and territorial integrity. And the GOP in the Senate continues either not to learn that lesson or to want to thumb its nose at tens of millions of voters. And the only response ultimately that will cause a sea change is to primary them, period, full stop. Um, so with that, I guess I'll transition to myself and an entirely different topic uh, with some domestic elements to it, which is the slew of attacks that have taken place against uh, American troops and American assets in the Middle East from Iran's myriad proxies and uh, the latest such attack, which proved deadly, uh, in Jordan. This was carried out by an IRGC-backed militia there. I believe it's uh, Khatib Hezbollah. Three American soldiers were killed in this attack, which is which marks more than 150 such attacks just since October 7th. Prior to that time, I think there were between 70 and 80 attacks by Iran's proxies on uh, U.S. assets or personnel in the region. Uh, three soldiers, again, died, were killed. These include Sergeant William Jerome Rivers, Specialist Kennedy Ladone Sanders, and Specialist Breonna Alexandria Moffat, as well as more than three dozen injuries as well. I think eight people had to be evacuated from this small outpost in Jordan as well. So, you know, there's kind of been a hysterical response um, on kind of two sides to this attack. Uh, basically with the assumption that 
the Biden administration is going to do something big to finally turn the tide and deter Iran after, you know, now we're getting up towards almost 200 attacks just since October 7th. On the one hand, you have fear mongers who say Biden's going to bomb Tehran and we're, we're going to end up in World War III. And then you have kind of saber rattlers who say Biden has to bomb Iran because the only thing that is going to deter it ultimately um, my kind of rather than take a position, the way that I would kind of spin this back and the reason I argue that there is likely to be more of the same in the way of optical actions, pinprick strikes, uh, a focus only sort of tangentially on Iran with, you know, an attempt to you know, maybe destroy a facility or maybe kill a couple malign folks in the relevant militia that executed this attack. And you know, what I kind of put back to people who make this argument that, you know, we should expect something strong now is the entire Biden administration Middle East policy has been about aiding, abetting and enabling Iran to make it the strong horse in the region that has fueled hundreds of attacks in the region by Iran and its proxies. The administration has bent over backwards every which way to enrich and empower the regime, starting with the unwillingness to enforce oil sanctions, which has flown billions of dollars into its coffers, uh, the offers, endless offers to put forth sanctions relief, lift sanctions in pursuit of a new Iran nuclear deal. Essentially, a shadow Iran nuclear deal has been taking place while Iran has dramatically increased its ability to uh, increase uranium enrichment to purity levels now of 60% or upwards of 60%, which is near weapons grade. Iran has massively increased uh, its deployment, its production of centrifuges, development of nuclear facilities, uh, and of course, proliferated weapons to myriad bad actors, uh, including drones to Russia in the Russia-Ukraine war. It's a malevolent actor that is being aggressive in essentially every sector. And the Biden administration's response is, let's free up billions of dollars to it. Again, not just in the form of those uh, unenforced oil sanctions, but also in the $6 billion ransom that was effectively paid uh, coming just before the October 7th attack, $10 billion in unfrozen assets uh, with respect to Iraq. And basically, again, the makings of a shadow nuclear deal where supposedly Iran was going to not continue to further be able to enrich uranium to weapons grade levels. We'll see if it ultimately works out that way or not. But all in all, my point is simply this. The entire policy has been predicated on what Michael Duran and Tony Badrin have called the realignment of America's alliances in the Middle East towards Iran, its proxies, its partners, and Sunni Islamic supremacist forces and their patrons as well, and away from Israel and anti-Islamist and but largely authoritarian Sunni Arab partners. And there is nothing to suggest that that status quo is going to change. And I, and I pointed this out at the time, but the Biden administration has strained to delink Iran's proxy Hamas from Iran with respect to October 7th. If you look at what the policy is now, as we discussed last week, towards Israel, it's essentially get Israel to end the war, which would be a loss for Israel. Trading hostages for thousands of jihadists that are held in prison. Uh, on the heels of this recording today, news broke that the Biden State Department is looking at plans to recognize a Palestinian state. Uh, obviously, these are all in the interests of Iran, ultimately. The administration also, as I've noted, is essentially trying to execute a whisper campaign and pressure campaign that ultimately aims to topple Prime Minister Netanyahu in Israel, which itself can be viewed as a win for Iran if the Iranians believe that a Netanyahu administration is more likely to pose a threat to its nuclear and other ambitions than a more left-leaning administration. Also, the Biden administration has done everything it can to deter and prevent Israel from striking Hezbollah to the north, rendering northern Israel uninhabitable for 100,000 people who have been displaced and essentially made refugees since October 7th. So add all of this up, it's unthinkable, it's inconceivable to me that the Biden administration would strike at Iran's tentacles, let alone at the head of the octopus in response to dead Americans, when it would completely contradict and undermine its entire policy, which has been about 
not just cowardice in the face of Iranian aggression and appeasement, but what I would argue is actually complicity. So uh, with that, you know, do any of you expect the Biden administration to do anything representing anything close to an attack on Iran or its proxies that would ultimately deter it here? Or do you kind of see it my way? And, you know, ultimately, how much worse will things should we expect things to get in the region? And then also, to what extent do political calculations come into play here? Because the the one check essentially on uh, total um, concessions and appeasement of Iran is the fact that we are in an election year and the American people clearly won't stand for uh, giving the Middle East in toto to the world's leading state sponsor of jihad. But I think it's going to get pretty darn close the way things are going. I tend to agree with you, uh, Ben, if not only for the fact that it took Biden three or four days just to say that he had made a decision on what the response was going to be. And you had uh, John Kirby, the NSC spokesman, talking about some kind of tiered strategy, whatever that means. I mean, I think at best we're going to get maybe some additional sanctions. And I mean, I admittedly am kind of conflicted on what the right response is because I don't want to escalate into a war with Iran. But I also obviously recognize that it is not acceptable. It has to be made clear that you do not kill American service members. I mean, that's just uh, like obviously issue number one. And if there's any lesson to be learned from this incident, it's that the policy of appeasement with actors like Iran does not work. Um, they have had freed up so much money, as you mentioned, Ben, and I remember the explanation being from apologists for the Biden administration being that the money had to be used for humanitarian purposes. Well, any idiot and their mother knows that money is fungible, right? So uh, just because this $6 billion is earmarked for so-called humanitarian purposes, great. Well, that's another $6 billion that they can pull out of their coffers elsewhere to use for advancing their terroristic practices. And so this entire exercise uh, in the Middle East that the Biden administration has been doing ha has just been an abject failure. So I think that Yorm actually had an excellent post on Twitter target touching on this, which is, and he made the point that like part of the problem here is we have all these bases with a tiny number of troops in what's in an active war zone and they're just sitting ducks out there. And I mean, these attacks have been going on as, as Ben noted for, for months and with no meaningful response, like other than blowing up a building when nobody's in it or something like that. Um, you kind of have two choices. You either need to be, if you're going to have troops like that, you need to be willing to deter and respond with the full force of the military, or you need to not have them there. And I think it's pretty clear that the Biden administration doesn't have the will to destroy Iran or the will to go to war with Iran. So it needs to get those troops out of there. It needs to get those troops away from those Iranian proxies so they aren't sitting there just getting traumatic brain injuries from the kamikaze drones. That just needs to stop. Simultaneously, I, I, I lean towards the fact that well, you finally did kill some American servicemen. There needs to be a consequence to that. There needs to be a cost. Um, you know, this is logic that goes all the way back to Rome, the idea that you wouldn't touch a hair on the head of somebody, of a Roman soldier or a Roman citizen's head. That the deterrence is gone. We need to reestablish it. Um, so very serious consequences need to befall the Iranian regime. I think Dan Crenshaw suggested something like a repeat of the Soleimani killing. I think that's about right. Uh, you know, target a major top leader or some sort of major ship in the, you know, Persian Gulf, like something like that, where, you know, there's a serious, serious response that the Iranian regime will understand and they won't do it again. And then also get our, get our guys out of there and have them stop being sitting ducks because can't, can't let them just, just flail in the wind like that. Yeah. I think just, there's a limit to that. Uh, when you include the Houthis, right. Um, shipping lanes are not something that the United States can, withdraw from, at least if it, it intends to be a, a global power. And even before the United States was a global power, it still took over that responsibility from Britain, who took it over from the Dutch, who took it over. Like the Keeping those kinds of shipping lanes open is a core national interest of the United States. Um, and so I, I guess like to some extent, I, I think that's, that's probably impossible for us to disentangle ourselves completely. Um, 
that being said, you know, that's that's why Israel is an important ally of the United States. Um, that was basically the, the policy of the Trump administration, right, which was pre- stop pretending that we can solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict by continuing, and I know we'll get to this in the final segment, but continue continuing to give, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars to the Palestinians to reset them at zero every time they they lose a war. Instead, let's let's be a little bit hard headed about this. Let's work with Saudi Arabia. Um, let's let's, you know, move towards Abraham Accords and and set up a Middle East that uh, is hostile to Iran being the strong horse in the region. That's obviously directly oppositional, as Ben has just laid out, uh, not only to the Biden administration, but before them to the Obama administration's policy uh, and and vision for the Middle East. Um, But yeah, I, I mean, again, I don't know that there are any excellent options here. Uh, but but the Trump administration policy of dropping a big bomb on uh, important commanders when uh, the Iranians cross the line in terms of poking the bear and poking the U.S. actually seemed to work fairly well. And, and people were terrified that was going to lead us into World War Three. And instead, it led to a relative uh, part of several, you know, at least a couple years of calm. Um, so the, the, we have directly in front of us, the evidence that these appeasements over time actually embolden these kinds of, uh, of, of some ultimately at this point, tragic, uh, and, and, um, deadly attacks from Iranian proxies. So that is clearly not the way to go. Even if you narrow down policy just to the last, you know, uh, eight years or so, you can see how it doesn't work and how, uh, you know, being more aggressive with Iran has actually deterred uh, escalating tensions with Iran because that's that's they became a little more afraid to poke poke the U.S. and that's a that's a good thing if you're trying to avoid a direct war. Um, we're running out of time, so I'm going to turn it over to Will. I'm next. All right. Uh, very well. Um, I'll go. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so my my topic is the the U- UNRWA um, and the amount of the the recent revelations that have come about uh, as a result of Israel revealing intelligence on the behavior of this UN agency in Palestine. So this is the agency that goes ahead and basically funds most of uh, the non-military operations that happen in Gaza. And there have been a number of revelations, first and foremost, that an, at least a dozen UN employees were involved in the massacre, um, the October 7th massacre, uh, including some Some were actually over the border kidnapping and raping Israeli civilians. Others were uh, back in Gaza holding, helping hold Israeli uh, citizens hostage, um, but they're, they were directly involved in, in the massacre. Um, and you know the UN has tried to say, oh, it's just a few bad apples. But more revelations have come out. There was a UN Watch story that reported that some three thousand uh, UNRWA UNRWA teachers were in a Telegram group chat where everyone was praising the the war and, and praising the battle against the Israelis, calling for the hostages to be killed. Um, there's some something like ten percent of UNRWA employees have a connection, direct connection to Hamas or or you know, either by a family member or themselves employees. And as a result, I mean, and, and basically, again, UNRWA facilities have been used by Hamas to launch rockets, to, you know, hold captives, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you basically have this agency that is taking in hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars from countries all over the world, including in 2022, I think there was more than 100 million that came from U.S. taxpayers alone to go to UNRWA. And that's employing Hamas sympathizers and money that's being stolen by Hamas. So it's kind of you know, my federal tax dollars going to help these terrorists build tunnels underneath uh, Gaza doesn't seem like a particularly appealing thing. And it's also just a very bizarre agency. Um, you know, they, they're they nominally a refugee agency, but these are people, you know, these are refugees who have been, quote unquote, refugees since 1967, a war almost uh, over 50 years ago. And they're de- claiming that the people who are the descendants of these refugees who have lived in Gaza their whole lives, m- adults, they're also refugees. Everybody who's a descendant of these people is refugees. It's it's distinct from almost every other refugee situation where the goal is to repatriate people to get them to safe countries. But because um, the Palestinian question has so enthralled both the Arab countries and the international diplomatic community, it's the idea that these people need to be eventually somehow returned to their land or at a minimum given like a full state right on the border of Israel, that you you have this bizarre agency that is working hand in hand with a terrorist organization. Um, 
it's appalling. The fact that our tax dollars are going to this stuff is appalling. Um, rightly, the United States has suspended funding for UNRWA as, along with a bunch of other agencies. But I mean, UNRWA's statements are there, are actually were entertained at the International Court of Justice and they're, they're ruling sort of splitting the baby ruling um, on the Israel-Palestine question. They were thinking about stopping the war based on, on statements from UNRWA. So uh, I'm glad to see that this the funding stop. Really, this is just yet another reason to, you know, just abolish, you know, destroy the UN building and um, make all these diplomats uh, tell them that their persona non grata need to leave the country as of yesterday. I would just um, point out that there's a an article from the Free Beacon today by Adam Credo that um, points out that Brian Mass, the Republican congressman, is accusing the Biden administration of intentionally waiting to make the announcement that they were going to suspend funding after they pushed out an additional tens of millions of dollars um, to that agency. And so uh, I would just caution us to be too careful in praising them because it looks like maybe they found some kind of workaround to make sure that they can have it both ways. But obviously these reports are beyond disturbing and a further indictment, I think, of just the international community in general and the fact that the United States um, routinely is willing to play ball with agencies that clearly are working um, directly against the interest of the United States. Yeah, we've given UNRWA uh, over six billion dollars since its inception, and uh, to Will's point, the six billion dollars, and this has been known by the way for multiple decades, but has been used to provide de facto, if not de jure material support to jihad, uh, not just in the way of personnel for terrorist groups or uh, intel collectors for terrorist groups, but in terms of the indoctrination of kids with uh, genocidal jihadist, Jew-hating, America-hating texts. So it perpetuates the very ideology that animates future generations of jihadists. I think um, Will, you're also right to note the fact that this is a peculiar agency, to, to say the least, when you're talking about an agency established at the time with purported uh, 700,000 plus refugees in one place that now constitutes up to 6 million people being eligible in a variety of different countries, um, many of them with zero connection, essentially, to the original uh claim refugees here. So um, in reality, when you step back, what it starts to look like is a captured entity of jihadist groups that exists to perpetuate uh, a war against Israel, ideological or otherwise, uh, by other means. And that, to me, is a pretty uh, representative illustration of UN agencies in and of themselves against the West more broadly. It's we fund an institution that not only thwarts and challenges our sovereignty, but creates moral equivalency between nations that are inequivalent or unequal and is used essentially to provide affirmative action or create global equity in effect. And uh, that speaks to uh, uh, one of the many reasons why we should consider cutting funding to any number of agencies and entities within the UN if not the UN in toto, and granted, you can have an argument about is it better to be a party to one of these organizations and fight within them or uh, step outside them. Uh, but nevertheless, I think it speaks to more broadly the rot and corruption that is inherent to and pervasive in the UN as a body itself. Yeah, I mean, uh, just to follow on, on, I think what Ben is hinting at when he says global equity, um, to, there is this idea one, that conquest uh, and war is some kind of like unnatural state of the world uh, that needs to be uh, rectified. And that's obviously not true. And it's even it's one step worse than that, because the, the lines are always drawn. And we always see this in the case of both Israel and the United States, 
when conquest is considered acceptable is is drawn based on who's the oppressor and oppressed and and often it's as simple as as flipping around that old family guy a uh, joke about where at the airport where you, s- you hold up um a pantone of uh, of skin colors to somebody in the airport and says okay and not okay uh the you know the whiter you are the more white adjacent you are uh the less conquest and war uh is acceptable and it's called genocide even when it's waged according to the the rules of the west um, and on the flip side, you know, uh, no, no massacre. And we saw this so clearly on October 7th, no, um, no mass rape as a tool of war, uh, no uh, direct appalling attacks on civilians, uh, cannot be excused if, if you're the oppressor. And unfortunately, this is not just something that we're grappling with in terms of the ideological shift in the institutions of the United States. Um, it's also basically the premise of a lot of these UN organizations. Um, the, the premise of a lot of the aid going to Palestinians in this case for decades has been we can't allow them to lose a war the way that you know thousands of groups of people in human history have lost a war and faced consequences, including losing land they previously had control over. Um, the reason I say these lines are convenient is, of course, like if you want to talk about indigenous and who's indigenous, uh, you know, thousands of years ago in the Middle East, uh, the Jews have a good claim to that as well. Um, and and Islam itself is a conqueror's religion that took over this land uh, by conquest, right? Um, but in any case, this is sort of the reality of the world. And we have propped up what is essentially um, the the dream of, and and this is the part that I think a lot of people are naive about, or at least the Biden administration pretends to be naive about, um, the reason that 25% of UNWARA, I can never pronounce that, um, is is uh, tied to Hamas and to Palestinian Jihad, um, by the way, 50% have close family members involved in one of those two or- terrorist organizations, is because it's very popular in Gaza, it's probably very the same reason the AP found itself freelance contracting with photographers who actually participated in the massacres of October seventh. It is the the you know um, it is the culture of the place both in Gaza and in the West Bank. Uh, what Hamas did on October seventh is very popular there. Uh, it, it that popularity has not really waned uh, despite you know several interviews with several brave people saying uh, that that Hamas has brought more destruction on the Palestinian people which is un- undoubtedly true um but nevertheless it remains popular and and this this whole global network um of of aid is premised on the idea that it's more humane somehow uh, more just to allow generations of people to live as refugees clinging on to the hope that isn't going to happen that they're they're going to get back that piece of land from the river to the sea by whatever means necessary and excusing all of the violence that they're willing to do um and and violations even of the laws of war that they're willing to do in order to get there. Um, instead, we continue to prop that up instead of just uh, accepting as has happened literally hundreds of thousands of times in human history, um, the the results of, in this case, multiple wars. Uh, so anyway, I, I agree wholeheartedly with the idea that we need to, to pull our support from these kinds of organizations. Uh, they are propping up a vision of global quote unquote equity uh, that is incompatible with the history of humanity uh, and will continue to be incompatible with with the the reality of of warfare and of, of uh, different human groups in my opinion sorry to zoom out that far um but but with that I'm gonna go ahead and and close us out with a segment uh, about something that went viral um which is is uh, Brian Johnson if you're unfamiliar with this uh Silicon Valley billionaire um this guy has decided he doesn't want to die, uh, and so he's become very uh, popular and viral doing all of these sort of medical adjustments and, and uh, supplements to himself to try to prevent himself from aging and dying. Um, but aside from that very weird uh, sort of hobby of his, he, he, he also gave an interview where he talks about the necessity of bringing about what he calls Generation Zero – a uh, a group of people, and he says explicitly multinational, uh, multicultural group of people um, who will cut themselves, and I, I want to actually use the exact words here, um, post-human blank slate belief and value, who will cut themselves from all human convention. And he says that that's, that's necessary. Um, 
the reason I think this is more than just a, a viral clip is I think it very much exemplifies the the view of Silicon Valley, the kind of dominant culture within Silicon Valley, which I would argue is post-national um, and uh, post-religious uh, in, in many ways. I wouldn't even say anti-religious, just post-religious. Um, and, and I write about that culture in a, a piece in First Things. It's called Ambitious Nihilism. Um, I grew up in, in that culture uh, as a kid, so I have some direct exposure to it. But I think this is a really good example of it where this guy, he can say things like year zero and not realize that there have been many people who have thought that before <laughs> in human history. Uh, and generally speaking, we don't think of them as the good guys. Um, we don't think of Pol Pot, for example, who wanted to launch a year zero in his society and cut um, and cut his society off from all previous human arrangements, traditions, and cultures. Uh, we, we we don't think of him uh, so fondly uh, many years later um, because I say this, I frame it this way because Brian Johnson uh, says he doesn't care what anyone today thinks about him. He wants to know uh, and cares about what people 200 years from now will think about him. The 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 lack of consideration of either theological or philosophical questions that goes into um, this this very ultimately very shallow worldview uh, in in Silicon Valley. Um, it's only important because because of the technological advancement, this group of people is going to wield enormous power. Their culture is very much going to become and is becoming the culture of the U.S. elite, even outside of tech. Um, it is just very influential, this kind of thinking. It's easy to dismiss these transhumanist ambitions as as um, kind of kooks or you know what people do with their money when they have too much of it. Um, but I think it, it actually really does represent essentially the view of the next generation of American elites. Um, and that's whether they're in tech or outside of it. So I, I don't know. I know this is a very general topic, but um, I'm opening it up to the group. Do you, do you think, first of all, do you agree with me that this uh, tech mentality uh, is becoming more common in, in other sources or other um, kind of elite breeding grounds, uh, whether that's the universities or, or just other industries like, um, like finance, for example, or uh, like in Washington, D.C., um, do you think that this mentality is, is uh, spreading from Silicon Valley? Uh, and what do you see as its dangers slash what can we do to, to counteract this kind of mentality among America's elites? I think there's definitely a level of narcissism that comes from this group of people where they feel like because they've engineered all of these massive advances in technology, that that somehow gives them the ability or the right to engineer and or perfect humanity. Um, and I mean, honestly, we even see that with Elon Musk, who obviously has been doing great work in trying to keep X or Twitter a free speech place, but also wants to put microchips in people's brains. So I always caution people about being too attached to any um, sort of big tech billionaire. Um, Brian Johnson in particular is a disturbing individual, even if you just look at him. Um, he goes on these podcasts talking about his anti-aging routine, and he looks inhuman himself. I mean, he he is in the uncanny valley territory. If you've ever seen the Guardians of the Galaxy movies, he looks like one of the gold people who like fly around in their little spaceships, um, really creepy individual. And again, I think it's a level of narcissism and arrogance to suggest that you can start from a blank slate and throw out everything that happened before because it's not valuable or it's um, or it's quote unquote bad. Traditions survive for a reason. Um, it's because they add something. Um, they they produce something or add some kind of value to people's lives. And to turn around and say um, that tradition only survives for tradition's sake is just a very naive uh, yet arrogant worldview that I hear often from both people in the tech space, but also from the progressive left, um, where they believe everything needs to be judged by modern standards that nothing from the past could possibly be acceptable or okay, um, that society has to be constantly moving, quote unquote, forward for it to be valuable. Um, so yeah, I completely agree. And as I, I think that this, this is a mindset that goes beyond Brian Johnson and will certainly be embraced by other members of the elite class because 
I think they will sort of want to co-opt the revolutionary mindset of the progressive left and use it for their own their own ends um, of re-engineering society and their vision as opposed to someone else's. I guess I'll be the contrarian here. Uh, I, I followed Brian Johnson for a reasonable amount of time. Uh, I think, you know, I, his year zero comments are kind of silly in my view for the reasons that if everybody's articulated, right? Failure to take into account history. People usually want to totally reinvent history, do very dangerous things. But in terms of the actual like program that he's primarily focused on, which is apparently basically doing, trying to reach the bleeding edge of anti-aging technology and protocol, um, and then publishing his results, publishing what he's doing, how it's how he's responded to it, what he thinks are ideal diets. Like I can think of worse ways for a billionaire to spend their money in terms of like helping humans. I mean, we we get you know a lot of billionaires trying to go to space, make us multiplanetary, but the, there is there is room and value for someone who's trying to be very you know very experimental and and uh, very public about improving health outcomes for people and um, fighting aging. If his reasoning is suspect as to why he's doing it or if it seems like narcissism well oh well you know we they're always in perfect vessels but you know i've read enough of his stuff where i'm sending here thinking like you know i'm glad this guy's doing the the health stuff seems like he's he's coming up with some uh treatments and experimenting with or some protocols that are very interesting i don't know i don't hate the guy uh and i'm less i guess i'm less like i i, I like some of the tech ethos more than maybe other people in our space do um but i don't know i don't hate the guy I think it's uh, logical to assume that whatever the trends are among the tech community will probably permeate other elite or pseudo elite uh, sectors or the cream of the crop within certain sectors because tech has supplanted the likes of finance or consulting or uh, big law in many respects in over the last decade or two. Um, but I think what remains sort of timeless and uh, seemingly unchanging is the idea that people who either on the basis of their credentials appear smart or in actuality have high IQs and or are wealthy by virtue or not of their intellect, then take that and translate that to uh, I have the secret knowledge and I auto impose that knowledge on others. And this is the smarts but lack of wisdom and lack of humility that seems to plague our elites to the nth degree and lends itself of course then to progressivism because if you know best uh, and you believe you also have a moral imperative to lord over others then obviously that's going to mean trying to impose those policies via the state and obviously this is baked into progressivism kind of from the start of you know let's have technocratic rule scientific rule essentially through politics uh, and obviously that leads to all manner of disaster setting aside the moral or anti-constitutional aspects uh, of the progressive agenda so i view this as a malady kind of of uh, that's plagued our elites for a long time which is first of all we kind of have pseudo elite elites who i think are probably incomparable in many ways to generations of elites that came before them but second of all, the notion that if you are uh, intelligent or materially successful, that somehow then you ought to lord over others and make decisions for others uh, is a scary and dangerous thing ultimately for society. So to the extent this is where kind of the tech bros are and that filters down into and permeates the other sectors, uh, it can only augur probably pretty disastrous things for the republic. Um, and with that, we'll be doing final thoughts. Um, I'm going to jump in here, take the moderator's prerogative and just wrap up the discussion that we are having. Um, I think uh, Ben has it exactly right when he talks about pseudo elites um, and selecting only for intelligence. Uh, there, There isn't, obviously you can't be a drooling idiot, for example, uh, and, and and be a good president of the United States, just to, to pick one example. Um, you have to be able to tie your shoes. But beyond a, a, a certain level of intelligence, there's actually, if I look in our history, there's not a very strong correlation between intelligence and wisdom. Um, there, you know, George Washington, 
not a dumb guy by any means, um, but but certainly not the intellect that uh, the raw intellect that like a Madison or a Jefferson had. They looked up to him for other qualities of leadership, um, and that that admiration was nearly universal. Uh, and if like thinking about a lot of our presidents recently, Wilson is probably one of the most intelligent presidents we've ever had. He was a disaster, uh, and not just by, by, from the conservative perspective, but but also, I mean, he he was a disaster at the time people people perceived him as a disaster at the time um and so th this this idea that uh iq raw iq um is all that is necessary to wield enormous power uh wisely is very dangerous in my view um and that is kind of what's pro the problem with the silicon valley mentality in my view one we have and this is beyond silicon valley um this is, I think, uh, part of the credentialing problem that we talk about all the time here is that we have essentially created a selective, like an imperial selective service for the United States um, in terms of getting into the elite. You take you take tests well, you do a lot of homework well, uh, and you're you're pretty smart. Uh, that system will reward you. I think Pete Buttigieg is, is sort of the pinnacle of that uh, type of elite. Um, I'm not saying all those things are worthless. I'm not saying it's not good to be smart and work hard, uh, but- the equation of that with the right to rule or with wisdom, um, I think, is an enormous danger. Uh, and then even within elites, like we used to have different types of elites uh, coming from different sectors of America. Uh, we had a, a, you know, Southern Southern Cavalier tradition uh, that, that led to a military elite in this country. Um, we had <laughs> different industries that that brought about different titans of industry who made their money in different ways. And now everything is sort of put through this selective service that uh, runs through Stanford and in, in Silicon Valley that runs through Harvard and Yale. And I think we we really are suffering a, a uh, calamity of pseudo elites that are selected for intelligence and for careful attention to teacher, whether the teacher is... Um, you know, on, on coding or on, uh, and, and homework, uh, or whether it's political, uh, political dictates that, um, you must repeat back in order to, to reach the next selective level of, of, uh, the service. I just generally think this, this elite culture is a problem and that these remarks by Brian Johnson, who I'm not saying is like a personally horrible guy. I don't really care what he does with his money, um, in the privacy of his own home, but I do think he has, he's emblematic of a tier, a new tier of elites, mostly coming from Silicon Valley, but also extending that mentality around the country who to quote Jurassic park that, you know, they wield power. They didn't have to do anything, uh, real to attain, um, and they're really unprepared to wield the kind of oligarchic power that wealth and technology and capitalism has handed to them. Um, and so that's why I find this, I find this remark emblematically scary of where our elites are going if we continue, if essentially the the populist revolution and various and nationalist revolutions in various countries fail. I think you're right, Inez, that uh, to point out the disparity between intelligence and wisdom. I think stereotypes exist for a reason. And I think there's a reason why um, for hundreds of years of entertainment, we see the incredibly brilliant genius generally being the evil character in a movie or a book. Um, like that doesn't happen by accident. But I actually wanted to go back to my topic and and break down these numbers on immigration a little bit more, because as you had mentioned, and as um, we would be looking at 2 million immigrants a year if we went by that 5,000 a day standard, that's about 150,000 a month. And if we compare that to the record uh, high month during the Trump administration of illegal encounters at the southern border, um, it's above that. So un under Trump in May of 2019, the record high was 110,000 illegal encounters. So 40,000 more than that every single month is what James Langford is trying to uh, trying to make as the measuring stick for what is an acceptable amount of illegal immigrants. Also, 2 million a year, um, we're looking at more than the population of, of some U.S. states. I mean, it's an outrageously high number. If you go to James Langford's Twitter account or his ex account um, recently, it looks like his comms team has basically been just like hammering out pre-scheduled tweets about immigration and about the border crisis. I mean, very stilted language, nothing specifically about his deal, just these um, like very... Uh, uh, 
pedantic statements about how we must secure the border and this is a serious problem, guys. We have to do something about this. I don't know who he's trying to convince through his Twitter account, but um, it's been quite bad. So I just thought it important to break down those numbers a little bit more. And I personally will continue to cyber bully James Langford until this deal gets abandoned. So that's my that's what I'll be working on. I also think it's worth always emphasizing that there is a massive political consequence uh, in the most direct sense to the massive invasion, which is, as I always like to go back to, apportionment of house seats is based upon, unfortunately, not citizenry, but the population in a place. And so we are poised when the next census comes around, which is the basis for the drawing of all house districts to have absorbed probably 10 million or more illegal aliens and house seats are going to be apportioned on the basis of where they are. And you have to imagine this is ultimately going to accrue to the benefit of Democrats and help them have a majority in the House. So even before you ever get to a mass amnesty, which is obviously the ultimate goal, uh, on top of, you know, kind of the Cloward Piven myriad chaotic effects of having an invasion, you are going to have a massive political shift and consequence, which is going to counteract probably the blue states that people were leaving and fleeing uh, and contribute then to a continued disproportionate political sway in blue jurisdictions. Um, that aside, I also wanted to talk about immigration. You know, we talked last week about kind of the US v. Texas, and it was worth noting that just subsequent, I think, to when we recorded, then uh, Governor Abbott in Texas put out a statement, which um, you know maybe could be perceived as a hyperbolic statement, but I think was really notable. Um, and seemed to galvanize a lot of support from like-minded states. Uh, that statement began with the line, the federal government has broken the compact between the United States and the states, which I thought was a pretty powerful way to kind of set the stage for basically laying out the myriad ways that the administration has sabotaged and systematically subverted uh, immigration law in a complete dereliction of duty by design uh, and that Texas wasn't going to stand for it. And then in the in this statement, Governor Abbott invoked the Constitution to defend Texas's policy of putting up barriers and actually defending its sovereignty, uh, raising Article 4, Section 4 responsibility of the feds to, quote, protect each state against invasion, and then appealing to Article 1, Section 10, Clause 3, which codifies the ability for states to take action to defend themselves if invaded, and the feds haven't done their job, basically. Uh, he also cites Justice Scalia, I think, in the Arizona dissent, um, acknowledging, quote, the state's sovereign interest in protecting its borders. Now, some uh, skeptical readers noted that Texas had not made this constitutional argument in some of its relevant briefings. And it's worth noting that there's not just this Eagle Pass related case of um, the kind of barbed wire that's being put up and then taken down by the feds. But there's other litigation as well between Texas and the feds regarding immigration, a, a broad array of immigration policies. Uh, but Texas has seemed to indicate, uh, Attorney General Paxson has seemed to indicate this argument will uh, win the day or will be one of the arguments that Texas is going to incorporate going forward. So it'll be interesting to see if and when one or several of these cases end up at the Supreme Court how front and center this argument is. I think it's a powerful and compelling one, and I hope Texas litigates it to its last breath. Um, yeah, I just, random final thought, I just saw some news that the State Department is looking at options to recognize a Palestinian state after the war is over. Um, prior and longstanding US policy has been to not recognize a Palestinian state unilaterally to make ensure that it only becomes recognized as a result of negotiations with the Israelis. I doubt there's too much to this other than basically the United States is annoyed with Israel not conducting the war on the United States' terms and therefore is trying to put out leaks to make is Israel sort of behave from the United States point of view. Still incredibly obnoxious stuff, um, but then nothing nothing too surprising from our State Department. Hopefully Israel just stays the course and does what it will. And ultimately, I mean, if Israel's militarily occupying Gaza, which I suspect it will after the war because it needs to ensure that Hamas doesn't rise up again, the idea that there will be somehow be an independent state there is sort of ridiculous.
All right. Well, uh, I think that that closes it out for this week. So on behalf of Ben, Will, and Amber, thanks for tuning in. I'm Inez Stepman, and we'll see you at the next NatCon Squad.